Okay, let me answer these questions. Number one, your journey from Monroe, Louisiana to Oakland has been a fascinating one. How has your diverse background influenced your musical style and career trajectory? Um, the answer is my father, solely my father, Elijah Baker Sr. He's a gospel quartet singer. And from what he was raised to learn in Monroe, he influenced my brother and myself um, how to play music. And we learned in church playing quartet. I started on the drums, ended up on the bass. Now I can play a little bit of everything, but that's where all the influence came from. My father, Elijah Baker Sr. Okay, answer to number two. As a founder member of Tony 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 Ambitious Records CEO, your role spans for across various facets of the music industry. Could you tell us about the transition from being a front man to a producer and a label owner? That is very challenging. Being a bass player, being a part of a group, is a very comfortable position to be. I never really desired to be a front man because I felt that I would get attention no matter what position you put me in. And nor did I seek it. I was just doing my job. As a producer, I'm raised on quality music. Um, cameo, Earth, Wind of Fire, Stylistics, uh, Parliament Funkadelics, Brothers Johnson, The Whispers, and the list goes on. Just the 70s, 80s era. Prince, Michael Jackson, you know, all that is uh, quality music from song one to song twin, you know, or so on. I, I, I want my Every song on my record to be a potential hit record. I don't look for fillers, and I won't make fillers. It had to feel like every song would be a hit record. And to become a label owner, it's just a normal transition. You go from being an artist and a lot of the knowledge you learn and being educated from mistakes you made. You know, you learn the business and. You try to be fair and you want to spread that light onto some new artists. So, therefore, you create your own vision, your own label, and your own direction. And you try to be different from what everyone else has going on so you can stay in your own lane. So, that's my um, goal and challenge from being a label owner. Okay, question number three. Tony, Tony, Tony was a pioneer in R&B genre. What were some of your most cherished memories and milestones during your time with the group that shaped your artistic vision? Well, to be honest, I always feel, felt that I would make it as a professional artist some form of fashion. Didn't know to end up with you know my cousins and Tony, Tony, Tony and, and childhood friends, but we all had the same vision and goal in mind, so... We all had the same sacrifices and had the same vision. That's why it was able to come together so fast. And um, I cherish the most memory about that. Um, I graduated 86 and was signed to a major record deal in 88. And I was on TV around the whole world two years after I graduated high school. That's the most cherished memory. Milestones is knowing I'm a part of a legendary R&B group that's going to go down in the books forever of having some of the best music. So that's what I'm proud of and cherish the most. Question four. Your contribution as a bassist, producer, and choreographer had left an indelible mark in the industry. How do you channel your diverse talents into crafting exceptional musical experience for your audience. I really don't put no thought into that. I just really be myself. Um, as a bassist, I wasn't in love with it. You know, I'm, I'm more just a people outgoing person. I just happen to know how to play the bass. Um, I didn't care to learn or try to be the best bass player I can be. 
I just um, pretty much it was in my blood and I could learn what I want to learn. And I just play based what I feel. And, and Raphael was a good influence of playing traditional and staying in a bass player lane by just playing the song and not overplaying because I could have easily got caught up in that. So he kept me, sometimes he was a little too strict, but uh, he kept me how to make songs with bass. So that's what he brought to the table, and, and that was uh, definitely a good thing. As far as choreographer, I always, you know, could dance. At the age of five, I was able to dance. So once I seen Soul Train, I was able to mock some of the dance steps. I knew I had it. And it just, I never even put the the title down as a choreographer. I just was a kid that knew how to dance and didn't realize I were, was being a choreographer, making up steps. So that was just a natural thing for me. As a producer, I'm my own biggest critic, so I'm, I'm real strict. Like I mentioned in, earlier, I was influenced by the best, so I try to just mimic and keep that streak going of R&B, just quality music. That's all that's going to come out my camp. Okay, number five. The White Collar Crime Conviction and 24 Years in Prison presented both challenges and opportunities. How did this period shape your perspective on music, creativity, and life beyond the spotlight? It was actually a great experience and a bad experience at the same time. Um, where it helped me at was I was, you know, in a solitary confinement. I was, I was confined. I was able to sit still because when I was on the street hustling, I was always busy. Never, never home, just chasing my tail, just always trying to figure it out. I had never had no time to sit there and even try to be creative. So that's where it helped me at the most. I was able to sit down, learn, do more reading and, you know, educate myself on life, music, um, being create, creative and hearing more um, different genres and learning that while I was away. You know, they had other musicians there also came from jazz background, the Latin community uh reggae community rock and uh you know just to learn all them different and jazz so just to learn all them different styles of music helped me be more creative and when i came out after i did the four years i was had a goal that i want to accomplish I, you know i want to have my record company my clothing line my sunglass line and my music and by the age of 60, I want to be uh, one of the biggest record companies there are, just like Bad Boys and Rockefeller and Master P and what Hammer and them did. I want to I wanna be able to do that as well. And E-40 and, you know, everybody who made their own way. That's what I want to do and going to do. I got five more years to do it. Question six. The former Mr. Park Avenue 3 TLB showcase your dedication to pushing soul music boundaries. What drive your artistic explorations and your mission to elevate the genre? I just refuse to be less than and go the cheap way out. I don't want to shortchange real music, live instruments. That's all I know. And I want to keep it consistent and, and the formula the same because... Live instrumentation will always be timeless. There's no date on live instruments. And the melody and, and, and for it being so melodic, it uh, holds more substance. And that way, you know, it can last a lifetime. So I only know one way, and that's what I'm going after. Number seven, ambitious record partnership with Suave House records demonstrate your commitment to collaboration because you elaborate on the ethos behind this partnership and the impact of the music industry. Well, Tony Draper is a good friend of mine, like a brother. He took me in as a producer. 
I um, produced a lot of artists, A Ball, MJG, and and so on, and a plethora of others. And he always created production opportunities for me. And he is a person who always believed in me, and gave me the push, and gave me the confidence to uh, do my own music. So that's where the collaboration came in with Suave House Records. Number eight, your involvement, Dr. Mary Lewis, you shed lights on Tony 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 journey. What prompted this decision to share the group's behind the scenes story and what can viewers expect for the upcoming release on Tubi? Okay. The number one question was, why did Tony 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 break up? No one knew the answers. Um, no one was willing to even talk about it because they may step on each other's toes. I didn't have no toes to be concerned with. I'm, I, I, did, I didn't go out there trying to be malicious. Um, I just told my truth. And the rest of the guys told their truth. And my initial reason of doing a um, loyalty no royalty document, uh, documentary was for them to hopefully look at it and say, oh, man, I didn't realize this is how they feel. This is how we did them. And that, that would bring us closer. But what it did is... Um, divided us and made us even more apart so that was my attention my attention was to so they could see the damage they caused for not standing up or communicating properly or just being a real family and 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 not be selfish and realize we made the same sacrifices they did so we all should have reaped the benefits that came in and because they didn't do that and i've been trying to get tony 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 together for since I got out of prison in 2012. And uh, Raphael kept promising. Sometimes he made effort. Dwayne didn't make no effort. And when I did the documentary, I sent it to them first. And no one responded. I sent it to Raphael, Tim, and Dwayne. And no one responded. So that was an opportunity for them to say something before I released it. So they didn't. So I just released it. And um, two million views later, it's, it's a great story, and it's informative, and that was all my goal to do. With it going on Tubi, it just created another a fan base and more people to see it. My first job as a filmmaker along with Chris Perkins. So that was my only way of uh, just going out there and expressing myself. Somewhat therapy. Number nine. With the Just Me and You two reunion on the horizon, how do you feel about Rafael Dwayne and Timmy reuniting without the founder members like yourself, Carl and Antron? Is that a possibility of reconciliation? Uh, I feel torn about it. Um, of course, it's wonderful and what's more flattering than anything, because of me, they back together with or without me, Antron or Carl, but I'm so I'm the sole reason Tony 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 is back together from that documentary. Raphael and Dwayne weren't even really talking until they came in cahoots after watching Loyalty No Royalty, which is fine. But the real win is for us all to be back together. It is not no reunion without the six people who helped get them there and their success. Who was there before the record deals? Um, I feel that they were, they did it out of spite, but they will feel it um, <laughs> that they're not being truly fulfilled because it's not still being done right. The only true win is for us all to get back together. And some people just going to have to mature and man up and have a conversation and just say they're sorry. If they don't do that, then it'll never be a reunion. Um it's going to be great. They're going to sound great, but it won't be the same. They know it, and the people are going to know it once they see it. Tony, 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 Tony is not the OJs. Tony, 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 Tony is a six-man group, a band. I will be missed. Carl will be missed. Antron will be missed. But Ray, Tim, and Dwayne will sound great, just like me, Antron, and Carl, Amar, and Jubu and LJ sound great. Tony, Tony, Tony affiliates. We all can do it together, but we're more powerful 
We all can do it as individuals, but we're more powerful together. But if you're going to be um, hmm, egotistical, stubborn, then let the chips fall where they may. If they, if they can live with that, let them live with that. I'm fine either way. Number 10, the R&B landscape has evolved significantly over the years. What are your thoughts and current state of industry and how do you envision a future trajectory? Truthfully, man, the music business at an all-time low. There's no creative, uh, no, no creativity. It's a long, drawn-out. All the female artists sound the same. All the male artists sound the same. There's no nobody being creative and being individuals and you know like we grew up man everybody sounded different uh it, it took it took eight hours to hear your favorite song come back on the radio because they had so much great music but now they only playing like four songs every 30 minutes the same songs and on top of that it's disgusting lyrics like it's genocide of music the lyrics is just putting our people down over sex, too much violence and, and drugs. The powers that be is banking on our downfall. So they are programming us with self-destruction. And as long as it's like that, it'll never recover. That's what I'm trying to do single-handedly with my label, just bring in quality music where there's true lyrics and people are really singing something uh, of quality and of substance. 11, the lawsuit challenge you faced was significant. Can you provide insights on the impact of those legal battles on your career and personal growth? The lawsuit challenge, um, it was sad. Um, it was nothing about it that was good. It was necessary. Uh, it didn't have to be. If we all could just sit at the table as men and discuss it, no one would have to dig in their pocket to pay attorney fees if we all sat at the table as men and have a have a discussion whether we agree or disagree. It could be ironed out if people are willing to apologize and compensate. We would make more money together than apart. I'm not really concerned. Money don't. I like money, but I don't love money. So money ain't going to make me do anything I want to do. But I earn that money. And that's why I'm fighting for it, because I have kids that deserve the benefits of my uh, labor. So that's why I fought it, and I will continue to fight in any way I can for my kids. And that's it. As a musical visionary, what's next for Elijah Baker? Can we anticipate new albums? I, well, right now, the most supportive genre as a black man is Southern Soul. And that's my roots, you know. My kids live in Texas, so I'm out there all the time. And I'm in California, so... And I travel a lot. And as I go through the South and Midwest and... Southern Soul, man, have a big supportive black market. And it's a thin line between Southern Soul music and quartet music. So it's it's like second nature for me to do it. And I and I really like it. It has room for growth for its quality production, but it's still winning. And I would like to go anywhere where black people are supporting. They like have like a Frankie Beverly and Mays following. So Hey man, that's the that's the route I'm going. And right now, you know, three T O B, we was able to complete some music so the world can hear what we can do on our own. Unfortunately, everybody's too busy and can't make the true sacrifice for us to have success as a band because everybody to pay their bills and do what they have to do to survive daily. But the world. It's out there for the world to hear. Whether they're here today or tomorrow or next year, they're going to be here that we were able to produce and create quality music equal to Tony, Tony, Tony without Tony, Tony, Tony. That's all I want the world to know that 
we're able to hold our own as well. We're able to contribute. I want them to hear that the influence they hear with Tony, Tony, Tony got the same ingredients in 3TOB because we're the original band. Some form of fashion It's a reason why 3TOB music sound the way it does. Thank you. That's it.